January 1999, the WWF is really starting to cook. They are starting to get on top consistently of WCW in the ratings war. We're in the heart of the Monday Night Wars. We're truly in the heart of the Attitude Era. You've got big time stars that are really starting to come into their own, like Stone Cold Steve Austin, The Rock, Mankind, and many, many others. It was no question an exciting time both in WWF and professional wrestling history. And in this period of time, 1999, Vince was looking for a way to capitalize on the resurgent popularity of his WWE product. He was looking for new ways to present his product to go outside of the box. And he came up with the idea of tying his product to the biggest show in town, the Super Bowl. So on January 31st, 1999, the WWF on the USA Network presented to you Halftime Heat. I was just sitting there and thinking about it today. I'm like, man, we're coming up on the Royal Rumble, we're coming up on the Super Bowl, and no matter what, every single year, when this time comes around, I, and I know I can't be the only one, inevitably my thoughts at some point wander to this specific show, 1999 Halftime Heat. I think about it with such great nostalgia. I think about it with such great reverence because I'm like, man, this represented such a great, fun time in the wrestling business, it represented such a great fun time to be a wrestling fan. And I look at the numbers that they drew for this on the USA Network, and this was cable, where you still didn't have nearly the amount of households with cable uh, and satellite distribution as you do today. This show running in the lead up to halftime, so during the second quarter of the Super Bowl, and that year it was the Atlanta Falcons and the Denver Broncos, and then the actual WWF title match, the empty arena match running during halftime. This show averaged a 6.6 .6 rating. That's, I think that was like 8 million viewers. 8 million viewers. This was a time it seemed like that this company could do no wrong. And the craziest thing about this show to me was knowing that they were going to have a lot of eyeballs on this product. Stone Cold Steve Austin was not an integral part of the show or any real part of the show whatsoever. And he was the dude in the company at the time. Sure, he wasn't the champion heading into this event. That technically was The Rock. But you know what I mean. It was Vince. It was Austin. They were the dudes. And with you building up to what would come a couple weeks later in the St. Valentine's Day Massacre Steel Cage match between Austin and Vince, it's finally going to happen. These two are finally going to wrestle. You did nothing to build up to that on this show, and it was crazy to think about. Because structurally, you would sit there and say, this is the hottest angle that we have. This is the hottest story that we have with the two hottest characters that we have in Austin and Vince. You would think you would build your halftime heat show around that, and they didn't. And the truth of the matter is, because of the depth of talent of the roster at the time, the creative juices that were flowing, the different things that they were doing, it didn't matter. Who cared? Because it still worked. Now ultimately everything leading up to the empty arena match was just really filler. But they were playing off of China at that time. Turning on G DX and joining the corporation. And the, you kick off Heat with her promo segment. Where she's like I finally get to talk. And you, you just kind of got the warm and fuzzies. Thinking about man you know. China was a big deal back then. And we talk about how much she was over. We talk about how important she was. And while certain people with different agendas and different belief systems within wrestling try to dismiss her, try to belittle her in her contributions, anybody that's a wrestling fan with a brain knows that she was a mega fucking star. And she ended up being a mega damn star. And it's just sad to think about the way her life ultimately ended, especially because at this time in 1999, 
her and Hunter were a real serious item. I mean, he was putting it in her booty hole consistently because that's what God liked to do even back then. Ugh. Maybe that's why he's only made daughters. But just watching it, it was kind of weird because you could tell based off of the way that they looked at each other at that time that there was love there. There was genuine care there. There was a sincerity there. And it's so heartbreaking to know how things played out. And ultimately, no, it's not Hunter or Stephanie's fault for the path that China went down and what ultimately happened with her. But it was one of those life-changing events with how everything broke down that began her down the path and she ultimately unfortunately never was able to overcome it I feel like get over it and conquer her demons and she's no longer with us and it was sad to see uh, then there was a match featuring the big boss man of the corporation taking on some slap nuts who guess what I'm not gonna do it I'm not gonna assume that position because it was so insignificant in the grand scheme of things. Then you follow that up with Ken Shamrock taking on the other half of the WWF Tag Team Champions, Owen Hart. And it's sad again when you watch Owen Hart here because this is the end of January 1999. And by Over the Edge 99 in May, he was dead. This is kind of very striking as I'm watching the show. I'm like, shit. Within like three and a half, four months, this dude was dead. I don't mean to be so crass about it, but you just never know. But watching Ken Shamrock, man, I've always felt like Ken Shamrock was a very, very underrated um, intercontinental champion. He was one of those guys, he didn't have a great personality, but the way they packaged and presented his character really masked the fact that he wasn't a great talker, really masked the fact that he didn't have an overpowering charisma. He wasn't that type of dude. But he was still a character. He still ended up being a personality. Like, you actually believe that this guy was a crazy son of a bitch and he didn't care. The look in his eyes, the look in his eyes. You're damn right the look in his eyes. He could work you like that. Ken Shamrock. Not a 300-pound steroid freak or anything like that. But you believed this was a legit badass. You believed that he was a crazy son of a bitch. And I've always felt like he doesn't get his due for the quality of mid-card champion that he was. Because at this time in WWF, he was an important character. The feud between him and The Rock was outstanding. The feud that he had going on at this time between him and Val Venus. I mean, think about the Val Venus. So many great characters. So many unique, different characters and personalities at this time. That's one of those things that you go back and watch in a time frame like this. And it strikes you just how much things have changed and not for the better. Like even with China's induction ceremony. After Triple H is talking, eventually X-Pac grabs the mic and he starts trash talking Shane. And usually, as a general rule, giving X-Pac a mic is a bad idea. See, the 25th anniversary of Raw is just one of many examples. But God damn it all, that European title feud between X-Pac and freaking Shane was money. As much as we might talk about X-Pac fuck off heat, get the hell off my TV heat, the guy had some really damn good feuds and some really damn good programs. And one of my favorite ones from this time frame was him and Shane over the European title. They did some good work, man. Freaking Shane at this time. He's on commentary with Kevin Kelly. I wouldn't give it to have Kelly Kelly back. Kevin Kelly, excuse me. Back in WWF. But Shane at this time, he was being obnoxious. He was being over the top. He was actually doing what a heel was supposed to do. He was a heel commentator putting over the heel wrestlers. How simple of a fucking concept. He wasn't sitting there doing this. He wasn't sitting there doing this. You knew Shane McMahon was supposed to annoy you. You knew Shane McMahon was supposed to piss you off. You knew who his guys were. And you knew as a result, as a byproduct, you did not necessarily want to root for those guys. You wanted to root for the other guys. Instead of what we get on commentary now, where we hate this guy, even though fans are supposed to cheer him. But I love this guy, even though fans are supposed to hate him. And it makes no freaking sense. And nobody gets over. But ultimately... The most important thing of this show, the thing that this entire show was built around, obviously, was the halftime heat component, which was Mankind getting his rematch against The Rock 
a week after their I Quit match at the Royal Rumble, which ended in questionable fashion with Mick Foley's I Quit, I Quit, I Quit playing over the loudspeaker. Just classic stuff. This is going to be in an empty arena match, even though there were camera people there, even though there were other people in the offices when they would, were fighting around the different places. But it was an empty arena match in the sense of there were no fans in the stands. Now, when you look at this match in terms of now, maybe you feel like the match doesn't hold up that well because there the spots weren't that particularly incredible. Uh, some of the action was really, really cheesy and really, really hokey. But when I look back at this, to me, this match holds up still incredibly well, if not more. Part of the problem being is they were trying to fit it within the confines of a certain amount of period of time. So they had to rush and get a lot of crap in. And you're trying to record it in different places at different times. I felt like they did about the best they possibly could with the match considering the situation. And ultimately, as you could hear Vince as he's doing the commentary for this match, you could hear that he was trying to envision this as a way to introduce new eyeballs, new fans to the WWF. And saying, this is not this training prayers and vitamins, WWF. This is a new, edgier, harder-hitting WWF. And you've got this crazy SOB like mankind. And you've got this freaking stallion in the rock. Sitting there and grabbing the damn headset during the match. And doing commentary. When the phone's ringing, he's answering the damn phone. Talking about it's the Smackdown Hotel. Oh my fucking lord, man. This was the rock, the rock. This was mankind, mankind. One of the great feuds of the Attitude Era beyond question. And in particular, Lee, in January 1999, these guys were cooking. The January 4th Raw where Mick Foley wins the world title for the first time. The Royal Rumble I Quit match, immortalized in part in the Beyond the Mat documentary. And then here, halftime heat. So you run the whole gamut. Over one month, you've had three matches, but my God, these guys did business. These guys did work. I mean, I'm laughing almost the entire match as Foley's hitting a rock with that massive popcorn bag. And even the finish, as ridiculous as it is, Foley gets in the freaking forklift. He's going to drop this pallet of crap on the rock, and you see the rock, and you just know how bad this looks. And he's looking up, he's like, oh, and then, it, then it gets put down on him, and Foley gets on top of it. One, two, three. Foley is the new WWF champion. If they did that today, they'd probably get lampooned. If they did that today, they'd get mocked, and I probably would mock them. But damn it all, in the times that this was, and the style that they were trying to get across, and the performers that you had in the story that you were trying to tell, this match made perfect sense, and I had so much fun going back and watching it again. It just gave me a reminder of how much fun wrestling used to be, man. And it's something I wish they could get to a point again someday where they could legitimately consider doing something like Halftime Heat again. Because even if they sat there and were only able to get 4 or 5 million viewers... It's vastly more than they get for the average Raw. Why not take a stab at this? Why not do it again? I'd absolutely freaking love it. I really don't feel like the company would have much to lose. And in fact, they could gain something. New eyeballs! And then drive them away a couple of weeks later. But if you're looking for something that reminds you of the good old times, maybe something that will help you get ready for this year's Royal Rumble, WrestleMania, just give you a reminder how much fun wrestling used to be, go look it up on YouTube. Go watch Halftime Heat, January 31st, 1999. It's like 45 minutes. You can last. And you'll have a blast watching this empty arena match. Like 8 million viewers did on that Sunday night at halftime of that Falcons-Broncos Super Bowl in 1999. Go watch it. Now, I'm going to come back in another week or two and do another one of these retro wrestling reviews. Time for you to give me your ideas in the comments section. And then once I get a few that stand out above the rest, 
We'll vote on them on social media, on Twitter and Facebook. And remember, this is OTR Essential. Not the wrestling show you want, just the wrestling show you need. Go watch Halftime Heat. You'll have a blast.